I'd like to take a few minutes just to talk about the ceramic head and how it's built and what the advantages and disadvantages are. So I'd like to do uh, just a, a few sketches here to introduce you to that. When we use the word ceramic, really w what we're saying is this is a clay that can be fired as opposed to uh, an oil clay or some clay that doesn't harden. One of the big advantages to this clay is that we can build this piece and then we can fire it and that's the finished product. No molds are necessary. Uh, another one of the big advantages to this technique is that we can build very large. We can go easily two or three times life size. Typically when working in this style, the elongation begins to happen. It's just sort of what it likes to do. And to get to that height, we have to start out small. And in the process, the two things that are really important are the architecture, the structure of it so that it can stand. And the second thing that's really tied into that is the timing, because the clay, when it's soft, is very pliable and workable, which is good. But if we try to build too fast and don't let the clay below harden enough or dry enough, which takes time, then this upper section could easily collapse the lower section. So we have to develop a sense of feel and timing and, and, and sympathy for the clay as we're building so that this clay is getting stiffer. So we may do this in segments and that would be entirely natural. Another way to do this, this I'm going to do in slabs, but this could also be done in coils. For example, I could start out with the bottom part and this would be basically the neck region. And so to get up to where the chin might be, if we're doing a, a, a female and we want a nice thin neck, then instead of a coil, a tubular thing like this, I could begin to do this in coils and build up. But for today's demonstration, I'm gonna be working in slabs, which is actually much faster. Another way to begin this would be to do this kind of a structure, just to build sort of a, um, an arch, and that could create the area of the upper torso, the upper rib cage, and then I could just insert that cylinder on top of that after this dries sufficiently and build up from there and end up with a, a slightly different structure than this. Uh, one of the great, great advantages we have with this technique is that we can work inside out. By putting my hand or arm down into the center, I can use what you might liken to repose or pushing from within. So I can work from the outside and the inside simultaneously, and that's a terrific advantage. It also allows me to keep checking the thickness of my walls, which have to be uniform. And so I'm gonna begin just in this section and let that dry, and then I'm gonna work my way up. This is going to be the first step of the hollow built head, and uh, I'm gonna start by laying down the, the base And this will give it a little strength as I build up. And it just has to be about, a, about an inch thick. Just so it's big enough that it exceeds the, the neck structure and then I'll trim some off. So okay, I'm ready to start the, the next layer. And I'm going to try as, as hard as I can to get a uniform layer of clay of a, maybe three quarters of an inch. And if it's not right, I can still adjust it and work with it. Now that's a little too thin. Sorry about the noise.
That's better. And you can always make it a little thinner by stretching it. And I'm going to make one end a nice clean edge. And that will be the beginning of the cylinder. And if anything, it's better that this first wall is a little thicker because it's on the bottom and this is going to be the, the supporting column. So I'm going to now knit this base to the column. It means just pulling some of the clay from the cylinder into the base and the base into the cylinder. And I'm going to do the same thing on the inside. And that way I don't have to wet it with slip and pre-score. Because I'm really joining that. And what that's doing, it's making the molecules of the clay go together like that. And that makes for a, a complete bond rather than just two pieces of clay coming together and then being smoothed over on the outside. And if anything, I want this to be slightly conical. So it should be leaning in just a little bit from all sides. So what I'm doing here, this knitting that I'm referring to, joining the bottom with the top, making that knitted together, I'm doing exactly the same thing on the inside wall as well, knitting that. Okay, so now I have to complete the cylinder. So I only need a piece about three quarters this long. I'm going to try to keep it about the same thickness. And that's about the right thickness there. Okay, so that piece is going to go on and again slightly conical. So my knitting really joining that together and I'm going to do the same thing on the inside with my thumb all the way down to the base and the same on this side so now I have a, a complete cylinder There's a little opening there, so I'm just going to stick a little clay in there, join it. And I can also push out a little bit if I want it to go a little more this way. Okay. So now I'm ready for the next level. I'm going to go up one more level. I think that's about all this clay could take. And I'm going to start by leveling that top area. Okay, I'm going to begin to now smooth this together. And the reason I like to do it as I go is because once I build my next layer on top, it's going to be harder for me to get my hand inside here. So uh, as I smooth this out, I can support that pressure by pushing in opposite ways. Okay, that's good enough. Now I'm going to continue on to the next layer. One level up. Well, 
it got a little thin, so I'm just going to double it there to make it thicker. And I'm going to determine uh, what the front is. If I have more space here, I think I'll make this the front because the chin will come out a little bit. So now I'm going to start toward the back of the head and build around. And I'm going to join this the same way with my thumbs. I'm going to knit that together on the outside, or on the inside, I'm sorry, and now on the outside. I'm knitting it together on the outside. Okay, I'm going to continue with this, uh, this second layer here with another slab. And this will complete that first section. A little too high. again and I'm going to let this slab hang out over the edge because that's going to be where the chin is, the lower jaw. And so I think this would be a good time to let this clay firm up so that we can continue to build on top and this will be dry enough to support the next layer. Okay, I've left this covered to keep it from drying out too much. There was a while that we did leave it uncovered so that it would get hard enough to support its own weight. So at a certain point I tested it I could feel that the clay was hard enough to support itself and the next layer that I'm going to add. And I've left this uh, little layer of plastic to cover the edge because this is the edge that I want to keep especially the wettest because this is where the clay, the next layer is going to be added. Okay, this has gotten a little dry here, a little drier than I wanted it to, so uh, when that happens, and it sometimes does, uh, we'll just need to re-wet it just a little bit, but just along the top edge, and again that will ensure a good connection between this next layer that's going to go up. So I'm going to score it a little bit, and some water on there. Clay is willing to do many things at different stages of hardness. And so we just have to get it at the right stage. Yeah. 
here we go with the, what is this, the, really the third layer, the third segment, I should say, and I'm going to join that right at the back and go through the knitting process again. And you can see it pretty easily at this point because I don't have to dig in. So I'm just knitting. And I re-wet this surface a little bit just to make sure that it's going to uh, blend with the, this new wetter clay. So I've begun to knit and you can see right along that border and now I'm going to continue right over here and I'm holding it with my other hand so that when I push it doesn't uh, push it over. And so now I'm going to come around the back and knit that as well. And I'm pushing from the inside where I want it to come out a bit. I'll just go completely around and knit that whole surface. And if it doesn't have the, exactly the shape that I am after just yet, that's okay. I can adjust that after it's joined together and becomes one. So this is going to be the, the back of the skull. This is going to be the jaw. And so now I can sort of estimate about where the nose is going to be, well, somewhere in this region. And I can adjust it as I go along also. One thing I'd like to do at this point is, uh, this is getting awfully straight here in the back, so I want to sort of pull that in a little bit so it feels like the neck is narrowing and then the skull is coming out. So in order to do that, I'm going to make this incision right about here. And I'm going to make a bit of a, a diamond shape. Now this clay's gotten harder, so I'm just going to remove that. And now I can close this in. So it comes together. Rejoin it and knit it together. So what I've achieved by that little tuck, it's almost like uh, darting, a, a, taking a dart out in fabric. I've removed it and now I've uh, lessened the amount of the surface and it's taken it in and now you can see that this goes in and then out. So I could even further adjust that by doing it again. Maybe this time a little smaller cut. And now in again. And again to knit. Now I'm going to reach inside and do the same process. And you can see a little bit when I push out, it moves. And so this connection has to be complete and really joined well. This broad tool does a good job of uh, pulling things together in a, in a general and a global kind of way. Now I'm going to take another slab and continue to build out around. 
I think I'll just wet this just a little bit again where I'm going to join. Wet it and then I'll go back again with a tool and blend the water in. And if you can keep this edge wet enough, sometimes you won't have to go through this wetting process. Okay, I'm about to take another slab. And I always try to get it about three quarters of an inch. And rarely is it ever perfectly three quarters of an inch. And I want to make a piece that's about the same height. I, I don't like to stagger them. Okay. Again, knit. Inside and out. This clay is very pliable now. And I don't feel any wiggling down here, which is good. So that clay is dried enough to be architecturally supportive. I need a smaller piece to fit right in through here. Now, even though this is drier and this is wetter, the water will slowly average itself out. The drier clay will suck some of the moisture from the wetter clay. And even if this hole is open, I'm going to just leave that open a little bit underneath the jaw to just allow air to go through a little easier. And if I have to adjust it, uh, I can do that. Okay, so I could start, I'm starting to think about also as I, as I build uh, my proportions, where the uh, jaw is, where the cheekbones are going to be. Uh, I can, I know, now that I have a, a mouth and an approximate volume for the skull, I could maybe make a line to remind myself that's where the mouth is going to be, the jaw is going to be right about here and come down. So now I can start to, I could push it a little bit in and I can push out here. I'm taking my, my middle finger and I'm pushing. Sometimes I use two if I need to be a little broader and I push out. And you, can you see that jaw moving out? And so now there, there's a bit of a projection. And the base of the skull is right about there, so that's going to go in. That's the mastoid area. And I'll do the same thing on the other side. Okay, so there's the jaw and the ramos, or the long aspect of the jaw, and then out to the chin. And notice that I don't take away much clay. In this particular uh, type of building, I'm just pushing the clay that's there around because I'm trying to achieve a uniform thickness. And if I start piling clay up, I'll have uh, an area that's maybe an inch or two thick 
and that won't be good because that'll take too long to dry. It'll dry unevenly. So I'm just using this slabs that I have, pushing out with my thumb all along the jaw ridge, and pushing in underneath it. All the way up to right behind where the ear would be. And so I like a, a large tool at this point just to start pulling it together a little bit. Get rid of some of those edges. It's easier to see the surface and read it without too much what I call visual chatter or noise. And if I'm pushing in this way, typically I'll reinforce the inside by keeping my hand there so I don't push the thing over. Okay, so now I think I'll continue on with this edge here. And I want it to be about that high, so I'll just shear a piece off of that. And it's a little thick. I'll squeeze it and get it about back to half to three quarters of an inch. And I can go a little thinner as I get higher. So there's nothing wrong with being an inch thick down here and maybe uh, a half an inch, five eighths up here. So on with the next section. almost enough to get to the nose. So I'm going to start thinking about some of the other structure in the face, the, the zygomatic bone, for example. And, okay, so at this point I, I really play it by ear. Uh, and I haven't really planned this out, which is uh, sometimes an interesting way to go. Um, uh, part of this process is uh, sort of an adventure. It's uh, building as you go. And you might have some idea of where you're going. Sometimes I do plan it out, and other times I just like to have an adventure. And this one is an adventure. So I've joined the top here of those slides, and the nose is going to be right about there, so that's going to be the next thing that I start to think about, and I think the way I'll handle that is just as a profile right now. And so I'll just stick a piece of clay on here, a slab, and I'll look at it from the side to analyze the profile. Check it out from the other side. And I don't have to make too many decisions at this point. I just have to give myself a, a general idea how long that's going to be. And now I'm going to drop down to a smaller tool. And I'll give myself a little bit of a, of a lip here, just so I can see that mouth begin to develop. And it's fun to get a kind of a character. Sometimes we, we have preferences, uh, physical preferences about angularity or a particular kind of a nose or a, uh, a sensuous mouth or, or a typical kind of uh, rather an angularity to the, to the bones that we favor. Some of us favor 
that angular approach. Some of us favor more of a, um, a robust and full shape. I've always leaned toward the angular, but so most of my figures tend to have that kind of a look because I enjoy those shapes. So out comes the lower lip, and then we go in toward the mentees, and out again. And notice I'm not really adding much clay. I'm pretty much using what's here. And then from time to time, I'll analyze it from the profile and see if that's coming along, how that's developing. And I want to keep analyzing also um, how stiff this feels. Make sure that uh, this feels good and solid. It's not feeling like it's collapsing or wiggling back and forth too much. Everything feels pretty, pretty good and solid right now because I have to determine whether or not this is firm enough for me to go up another layer. Sometimes I could, uh, if I really want to keep going, rather than make a big layer, I can make a smaller layer. That's not quite as challenging and uh, as dangerous. So right now I think I am going to add a little clay just to the sides of the nose here to give that a, a pyramidal shape. And I may have to, if it gets too thick, I may have to hollow that out from the inside with my finger or a tool. Sure. So if it's getting too thick in here, I can remove a little bit right where the nose is, just so that it doesn't get too thick and solid in that area. The nose is coming about there. That's about where the nostrils will be. And I want to think about the center line. As long as you have a center line, you won't get lost. You'll have a, a feeling of how to balance it. So, for instance, now I, I, once I saw that center line, I realized that that mouth barrel needed to be a little more uh, symmetrical. So now the next biggest shape, the two big shapes now are going to be, I've got the mouth barrel. I'm beginning to get a suggestion of um, the zygomatic, I have an idea where my jaw is coming. So I think I'm going to make it even more angular. It's fun with this kind of a construction to really push it and to uh, exaggerate things and just have fun with it. And I'm pushing out with my fingers to create this fullness for the zygomatic. And sometimes I might have to go back and re-knit some areas if they start to come apart a bit. Right in through here, this mouth barrel could come out a little more. So I'm pushing with my thumb, and you see it gives immediately kind of a pneumatic quality, meaning uh, full of air, full of life. And now, get some nice wet clay and add a little bit of clay for the nostril. A little clay for the nostril. And once I have a nostril, then there is the nasolabial fold. And that terminates the mouth barrel at the nasolabial fold. At that point, we're transitioning from the upper jaw, the maxilla, into the zygomatic. I'm going to continue and build in the eye socket up to about here. And then I'm going to let it dry and rest for a bit so that it will be strong enough, this new clay, to support the clay that I'm going to add.
Well, this has changed a little bit since the last time you've seen it. After I covered this to, to keep it wet along the edge so that I can add my next layer, um, I started to put in some features because before this gets too dry, uh, you know, I have there has to be a certain dryness to build up, but it's still uh, workable. So I thought, well, I'll just begin to develop it. And, and it began to uh, uh, give me an inspiration for a, a kind of a pan figure. And uh, so I, I sort of went in that direction and, and developed it a little bit. Uh, one other thing that happened shortly after the last segment was I noticed that this head began to just tilt a little bit. And so I stuck a piece of uh, a clay block under there to keep that from, from going any farther. Okay, we're ready to remove the plastic and add the next layer. That stiffened up considerably. Okay, that layer got a little thicker than I wanted, so I'm just going to stretch it a little bit. The clay can be thinnest at the top because it doesn't have to support weight anymore. And generally I like to keep it as, as thin as I can just because it's a big piece and uh, it'll make it easier to move. Okay, I'm knitting again. On the inside. And I'm going to start to dome this over because we're coming in to form the top of the skull. And now I'm going to start to join this back. Later I'll come back and add some detail and hair. But for right now I just need to get this joined. I like to look at it from the side and see how that profile is coming. And if I want to make it go in a little bit more, what I'll do is take a little section out, take a little V section. And it's just like clothing, I'm taking out a dart and then I'm joining it back together again. And what that did was it changed the, the profile of the back to come this way a little bit. And now it's going to pick up some strength on its own just as a, an architectural dome does.
I'm rethinking this a little bit as I go. Uh, my initial plan was to build a little land bridge from the back to the front and then add the horns last. Hmm. I think I'll continue with that. So I notice I have a little air bubble here. Okay, so when that happens, it's going to create a weakness there. So I'm just going to put a little blowout patch in that, and fill it up. Now I'd like that to be a little a little longer. Start here at the forehead. See, I can still, I left myself an opening that I can still get my hand in there for a little while. This is going to be just about my last opportunity though. So I want to be able to get the fullness in through here and begin to dome that. I've already knitted it so now I just have to blend it. So you want to examine your, your profiles to make sure they're doing what you want them to do. I'm going to do a little more knitting here. I don't usually add clay, but it feels a little thin here, so I'm just going to add a little bit to beef up that seam. And so now the, the structure is set. So now I just have to, uh, I have actually never done this before with, uh, with horns. Uh, so this is going to be uh, new to me too. I can feel that little blowout patch is getting a little thin. So I'm going to have to add a tiny bit to that. And I'm going to plug it again from the bottom or from underneath. This technique of building is always kind of an adventure. You can plan it out, and I do sometimes when I'm doing a specific figure, a historical figure or something like that, or a particular character. But in this case, uh, I just wanted to have an adventure. And I do that a lot with these hollow heads, and they, it's always interesting to see where they take me and what will lead to the inspiration. And on this one, as I worked uh, on the lower face, the ear started to flip out and it started to look like a, a sort of a goatish kind of figure. So uh, it's always a, an opportunity to do a, a, fun, a fun kind of uh, iconic piece 
And I'm going to put another little patch in here. And at some point, I might not be able to mend it so much underneath. So I'll have to do it pretty firm from the outside. I was going to let this dry, but, uh, you know, it's so strong because of the, the arch and the dome that it's really allowing me to continue, so I think I just will go on. And you see I'm supporting with this hand the inside and that way I can apply pressure on the outside without caving it in or making a flat spot. So little by little I'm narrowing this down and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the horn last and then I'm just going to plug them in. At least that's the plan. We'll see. Just building out from my existing wall. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take a piece of clay and push it over the form like that and then squeeze and that way it joins it from the inside and the outside. Now I'm just doing it in little pieces rather than slabs. I'm just adding pinches. And that way I have a little more control. All right, I'm going to continue now. And the next step will be to put the horns on. I've made a horn. I figured out a quick way to do it, and so uh, I'll show you in a minute how I did it. But uh, for now, I'm just going to add this horn, and I've left this one area open, so now I can stick my hand in there and decide how I want to, which way I want this horn to go. Uh, okay, I think I'm going to have it go that way. And now I'm just going to Everything is nice and wet, so I'm going to do my knitting. And it's really nice to be able to work on both sides. I won't have this luxury for the second horn. In fact, I think I'm going to add just a little bit more on the inside just as sort of a mortar or cement to make that theme a little, seem a little thicker. And of course this, this horn is hollow too, so it's not going to add to the weight. Well, that's pretty much what I've done. And now I'm going to turn this into hair and make that, make that nice. And so now I'm going to just make another horn 
And the way I did this was just to form it around my thumb. I did this one with my with my left thumb. I think I'll do this one with my right thumb and and that way because I want this horn to be be hollow just like everything else. Otherwise, it'll be solid and it'll take much, much longer to dry. Uh, it could shrink and create a crack. And I want these to be very dull also so they don't become a danger to anyone walking by. And now I'm going to flare it out a little bit on the bottom. Just trying to fit it now to see how much I need to add on. And so I'm going to flare it out a little more. So that will be what I can attach with. So. Right, I'm just adding, I'm taking a bit and just pinching it over the edge to elongate the horn so I have something to blend it into the skull with. Kind of like making a pinch pot. And, uh, Measure again, and I'm just about there, but I have to leave myself enough excess so that I can drag it into the surface. And I'm going to have to be careful because I don't want to cave in this skull. So I'm beginning to just knit it in slowly. Now this is going to take a little longer to dry because the, the whole head is covered now so air can't get in. At some point, I'll, after it's stiff enough, I'll lay it down on its side so that the air can get inside and then it can dry evenly. So now I'm just finishing it off a little bit. I'm going to add some hair. But basically, this is what you need to know to build uh, this hollow built structure. And as you can see, there are many ways to finish it off. Uh, on your head, you probably won't have horns. So, but you might have a, a particular kind of hairstyle. Or, or maybe you'll just have a, a bald head and you'll just close it as a dome. And just little... Little by little, just close it up. Everyone is a little different based on what the design is, whether it's a hat or horns or a specific, a specific hairstyle or something like that. So when you get to ending it, you're, you're always going to have to figure out your own way to do it. You just have to remember that uh, you just have to be careful. Uh, make sure the clay is still wet enough. And as you close it up, it will get stronger and stronger and you can just knit smaller pieces to it and just slowly close up that, that opening. Today I'm going to do a patina demonstration and I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk about why a patina is important and what the purpose is for it. When we end up with a relief or a three-dimensional portrait, it's usually going to be either in plaster or in terracotta, fired terracotta. And it's going to look like a raw material, and it's not going to photograph very well. And it's, it, frankly, it's not going to look very beautiful. So what we have to do is apply a, an artificial patina. That involves many layers of paint, 
Uh, if we were in the ceramic world, we would do this with glazes, but it's much easier to do it in paints and we have a lot more choices and it's a lot more forgiving actually. I'm not a painter, so I'm not a color expert, but over the years I found a couple ways to approximate uh, what I call, for lack of a better term, an old world patina. And that is to, to mean that it, it looks like something that has been around for a while. It looks like something that's accumulated some age and character, and it gives it a, a complexity and an integrity, and, and not to say a beauty that a dead plaster or a raw terracotta has. So I'm just using a, a very small palette, uh, a, few, a few warms and, a, and one cool, actually, and a black and a white to uh, just to deaden it a little bit so it's not quite, quite so bright. And the paint that I'm using is casein, and it's made by Plaka, it's a brand, and it's uh, unusual in that it's a water media, it's a water paint, but once it dries, it's set. And now I can go back again and apply a second and a third coat and letting it dry in between, and it will not attack the first coat that I put down. So what I'm going to start with is a warm base, and it's going to be uh, opaque because I'm going to be painting over that. So I'm going to go back and forth between warm and cool. And that temperature change layering is going to give it a, a complexity. So with that, I'm going to start to uh, put a little terracotta and a little bit of black to deaden it, get a little, a little darker. And I'm going to, here we go. And you want to make sure that you get the paint into all the little crevices because we don't want that white showing through. And if you get a few paint strokes or brush strokes in there, don't worry too much about it because you're going to come back and we're going to be layering over that with another color anyway. And this paint's going to dry pretty fast because it's a dry plaster, so the, it's going to, to uh, absorb it. I want this to be nice and opaque. And even if it's a little uneven, not to worry, because we're coming back with more colors. Okay, so I'm going to go all the way out to the edge. Okay, so that's just about it for the first coat. And we're just going to let this dry for a few minutes. And then I'll come back and apply the second coat. Okay, I just want to let you know that um, I've uh, added another coat of the brown just to make sure that it's a nice thick opaque coat. And what I'm going to add next is a little bit of green. Now patinas are a, a very personal thing. So some people like greens, some people like browns, some people like gold. Uh, so you can reverse this process. You could start out with the green and then you could go over with the, with the brown. And, uh, and then the third coat is going to be to mix a little more white in it and it's going to be a wash that's going to settle in the, the low spot. So I'm going to now put a little bit of green. Okay. And I'm going to mix a little bit of brown into my green. And, and I think I'm just going to Put a touch of white. There, again, there's no rights or wrongs here, but you see the, the white knocks away the intensity of the chroma. So 
know, I'm not making this so thick that it puddles. And this paint dries very quickly. I just use a tiny bit of water. And if it's a little transparent here and there, that's okay. I just want to make sure that there's no raw brown showing through. So this patina could look like uh, an old world terracotta, or it could look like a, a bronze, or it could just look like an old plaster that's been sitting around for a long time and has accumulated some age. Antiques always look prettier than new things. because they have the complexity, that time-worn look. They have a little dust in the surfaces and the low spots. And Okay, so that's my second layer. And now I'm going to let that dry for a few minutes, and then I'll come back and, and add the next one. Okay, now the second coat has dried, and it's looking pretty nice. It's, it's kind of a nice temperature change because I'm seeing the brown come through the green. And I think I'm going to give it another coat, but I want to show you at this point just the magic of this material, this casein. And I'm going to burnish it, just starting out very lightly with a, with a very soft cotton, cotton rag. And I'm going to go slowly at first. And you've noticed that this material is very matte. But when I start to buff it and rub a little bit, what happens is I'm literally compressing the paint together. And so now what's happening is by pushing down and rubbing this, I'm revealing a little bit of the underneath or the first layer. And it's also bringing a luster up to the surface and where I can't rub down in the crevices it's remaining matte and just that fact alone is enough to make it look like an antique because with most paints if I were to do this with acrylic uh, whatever I do the quality of the paint is going to be the same whether it's shiny or matte but with this paint it's a combination of the two And the harder I rub, the more I can bring that, that coat to the surface. So I can still go back and put more coats on this. It doesn't mean that because I've, I've rubbed it now, I can't do that. And so once this material has a, a luster, it's kind of hard to believe that it's just regular old plaster underneath. And I can show you the luster that it starts to pick up. This casein paint is the only paint that creates this effect. And it's partially because of the milk fat. Uh, they may have a little wax in it. I don't know what the recipe is. But the beauty of this paint is that it does bring this luster to sculpture. And uh, because when you're buffing, it just buffs the high spots. It leaves the low spots matte. So already you've got kind of a two-speed surface that makes it seem like uh, a piece that's been around for a long time. So uh, that's one of the reasons that I love this casein paint so much. So I think I'm going to start to uh, add the last and final layer. And, you know, again, there are no exact recipes here. No rights or wrongs, so uh, you may get this far and decide that's, that's as far as I want to go. And, uh, and this layer is going to be a little thinner, a little more watery. So I'm going to try to mix enough watery paint here to get me through the whole thing because I don't want to have to remix in the middle. I'll never get it the same consistency again. Okay. And this is why it's, it's really necessary to use a nice soft brush 
This is a, I believe, a sable watercolor brush. And I don't want to fuss too much. Just get it on there and then be done and let it sit. I'm just going to let that set now. And the only thing I might do is if there's any areas where the paint is pooling, I'll just let the brush suck that up. And I'll let that dry and come back and give it a buff. Now this most recent wash coat has dried. And I'm seeing it's a little, a little lighter than I, I thought it would be. And I'm considering giving it another coat. And, uh, but first I'm going to buff it and take a look at it. And sure enough, it has given it a little more, a little more contrast than I wanted. Some people might like it like this, but it's not exactly what I was going after. Uh, but I will show you what it looks like at this point. And you can see the luster again. And I think I'm going to go one more time. And this time, the white is going to be a little darker. So I'm going to go into that white again. And a little brown, a little black, a tiny bit of green. And again, it's really, the color is not that important. The main thing is that you go back and forth between a cool and a warm and use the white and black accordingly. I like to stay in a value range of about a middle range value of anywhere from 30 to 60% on the, on the scale because that way, the highlights show and also the shadows. If you go too dark, the shadows won't show. And if you go too light, the highlights won't show. So uh, middle, middle tone is the way to go. I'll do a little test on the side here just to see where I am. Okay, so I think that'll take cut that white down sufficiently. And when I'm doing patinas at home, I sometimes will go six six different layers getting the the look that I want. Okay, so I'll let that dry for a little bit and come back and give it another buff and we'll see what we get. Okay, I've given it one more wash to, uh, to even it out and uh, I'm going to give it a, a light buff now and see what that looks like. And sometimes just uh, buffing in some areas and not in others can uh, improve it. And the patina likes to get into the, uh, the details. And that's why it's nice when you're, when you're modeling to leave a little surface texture so the patina has something to hang on to. Okay, I think that's uh, not bad. Okay, so I'm relatively satisfied with that, so I'm going to let it go. Uh, if I were home, I might add a few more. I might test it a little bit. And, uh, but remember that every time you add another layer, you're filling in a little bit of the detail. So um, there is a limit to it, but uh, enjoy the process, and, um, and good luck with your patina.